So now we're going to talk about some advanced data types beyond just string equals spam. Um, we'll be talking about uh, really four built-in types. Can everyone hear me okay? Try to get a mic. Um, we'll be talking about uh, four um, built-in types. And um, we'll just go in order. Uh, list, tuple, or tuple, um, sets, and dictionaries. And uh, the way to think about all of these is that they're essentially sequences of objects. Um, some of them are changeable. Some of them are not changeable or immutable. And they all have different properties. And you're going to wind up using them, uh, not necessarily all of them in every code, but many times you'll wind up using uh, 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 different, different uh, types um, to sort of satisfy different needs within, um, within your code. So I'm going to start off with tuples. And um, what I'm going to do is present this to you through uh, the notebook. I think I can just get rid of that. So this is the IPython notebook. And you see I basically kind of laid out where we're going to go with all of this. And uh, I haven't told you the results of any of it yet. Um, so this is uh, sort of a nice thing, I think, hopefully for teaching purposes, um, that you can have this notebook saved. In fact, we have the PDF of this notebook, a, a raw version of the notebook, and also a markup version of this notebook, also linked from uh, the website. OK, so tuples. Those are denoted with um, parentheses. So if I go um, to this first cell right here, I say t equals 12 minus 1, and I can print the type of that. Hopefully. It's not working. Hmm. I have to dump out the notes. Run selected. Yeah, it should just work though when I type. Oh, I'll just do this one. Okay. So, um, there's our answer for our first one. So I just created uh, some, um, some object called a tuple. And if I want to now ask is t of, uh, of type tuple and ask for the length of that, I get true. And length is 2. So now we think of what the tuple contains as basically a bunch of different elements. So now I'm up here in 3. T equals 12 Monty true minus 1.23 exponent 6. You notice right away that if this doesn't give me an error message, then it means that tuples can contain uh, a mixed different type of, uh, of, of variable. So here's an int, here's a string, here's a boolean, here's a float. And if I print the first element of that tuple, not 0. There's the first one. I get, I get back Monty. Okay, that's really nice. All of these things that we'll be talking about essentially can contain a heterogeneous uh, set of objects or um, variables inside of them. So you could have dictionaries and tuples all sort of um, interleaved with, uh, inside of each other. Okay, um, T minus 1. What's that going to print for me? What's the minus one-th element of the tuple? Minus 1.23, yes, exactly. And notice it didn't print out this. It printed out the string representation of that. Okay. Minus 2 to the end. So I'll get the last two elements, and I'm going to return that as a tuple. So we're basically using the same sort of notation that we had when we were slicing and dicing up the, the strings. True and minus whatever. OK, now this is an important thing in con constructing tuples. x is equal to, just like I said, um, uh, parentheses true. And I'll ask for the type of x. Then I'll say x is equal to true comma. If you put parentheses around something, what Python natively wants to do is just evaluate it. So, Python just per, put parentheses around it. It's as if I said x times 5 equals, or plus 4, right? And it would just evaluate that. That's um, what these parentheses mean to the Python interpreter. So to say, no, I really just wanted a one element tuple, um, you actually have to add a comma afterwards. This is a little bit of a, of a quirk, but hopefully it should make sense. So 
So if I ask for the type of this empty thing here, I'm going to wind up getting a tuple without the comma. If you try to create a tuple with a comma and nothing else, it will complain to you and say, I don't know what you're talking about. So if you want one element, you need to do that element and a comma. If you want a no element tuple, because that's how you roll, um, you just want to do it with, uh, with open and close uh, parentheses. The length of open and close tuple is just zero. And you notice what happened. I returned here, I didn't say print, I just returned. The result of me having done a comma here implicitly created a tuple response with, with parentheses. So if I say type um, this uh, parentheses with a comma, I get an error. It's an invalid syntax. <laughs> Um, okay, so the, the sort of the, the big picture here here is that we have um, uh, the tuples that look like element comma something. The other thing that's important is that we can't change a tuple um, uh, once it's already been created. It's an immutable, essentially an immutable array, or immutable list, if you want to think about that. T2 equals false. Um, I get an error because I actually try to change um, something inside of the tuple. T going from 0 to 2, so I'm going to wind up getting how many elements back? 2 minus 0 is 2, comma false, and then 3 beyond that. Let's see what happens. What did I get back? Well, this slicing operator inside the tuple uh, gave me back a tuple in this form right here. And then I got back false, because that's what I asked for here. And then I got something else here. You notice it's a single element tuple. And then the whole thing, as I constructed it, was actually a tuple. So I just created a tuple of a tuple, a Boolean, and a tuple. Probably not what we wanted. Instead, what we wanted is probably something where we do a concatenation. Just like with strings, tuples know how to interact with other tuples and respond back to us with something that makes sense. So what I really wanted is, I want to tuple back from this, I want to just add onto that another element, false, and I want to, uh, I want to concatenate that with the last element of uh, the T tuple. Oh no, but we can't, we can't actually concatenate, right? So just like when I actually added um, an integer when I was trying to add it to spam, the string spam, and we had the number three, um, we're not allowed to do that uh, either. We have to actually cast it. So the proper way to do it is the following, where we have to have a tuple, we have to add it to it with another tuple, and have another tuple here. OK, that's probably what we wanted back. Any questions about that? Yeah. Um, how is a tuple different from a list? You can't reassign things to reassign. Fundamentally, that's the biggest difference. So I, I mean, this is a bit of the coding practice, but when I know I've got some immutable data object and it's complex, and I want to make sure that no other code farther downstream from its creation can change it, I'll make it a tuple. If I know I'm going to be passing data around and I don't mind some other part of the code changing an element of it, I'll give it a dictionary or I'll give it um, a, a list. What's that? Oh, right, so Varian's reminding me that there are methods, so these are essentially functions that know how to operate on different types. Those, the methods between lists and tuples are different because they're ref one's reflecting the nature of the mutability and one's reflecting the nature that you can actually be changing stuff inside of it. So just like with strings, when we had a multiplication, uh, we can do the same thing here. We should get back something pretty sensible. I just got a longer tuple that's basically a double copy of my original. Okay? Um, I think I wanted to show you something else with tuples. No. Okay, so we'll go to lists. Any questions on tuples? Yes? No, so, the, so you can't. Um, that's a good question. What if you had two bowls where you had a bunch of um, numerical elements in each of them? Um, 
and you wanted to essentially, you know, uh, cell wise or, or column wise, add all, all of those. You can't do that with tuples. What you'd have to do is essentially loop over both tuples simultaneously and do the math yourself and, re and sort of emit back a tuple. Um, sort of typically what you'd be doing when you're doing that kind of math manipulation on, on arrays or lists is that there's a concept of an array um, in Python, but we usually use it uh, in something called uh, NumPy. And um, there you get sort of exactly what you're expecting. You had two arrays or two lists, and you said add these two together, it would add them up element one. But in this case, that doesn't work. So there, there are ways to do it, and ways to do it really quickly, um, but the Python built-ins um, sort of force you into doing the addition in a different way. Yeah? Can you build in ordering functions so that you can sort? Uh, yes, you can. We'll see a sorting on lists, and we can actually sort on different elements in the list. That's actually part of your breakout. Yeah? Yeah, for those that kind of have already worked a bit with object-oriented <coughs> programming, each one of these types has a whole bunch of methods on, that knows how to operate on itself, interact with other objects of, of the same type. All right, so let's go to lists. Um, it's just like tuples, except it's denoted with square brackets and not parentheses. So here we have v equals 1, 2, 3. We'll print the length of v, the type of v, and you can guess what that's going to look like the number three, and it's of type list. Uh, we can slice and dice that as well. V uh, colon two, get back the first two elements. V is equal to eggs, spam, minus one, whoa, and then a tuple, and then another list. What's the length of this? I hear five, what else? So, We've got one element, two elements, three elements, four elements, because this tuple is considered a single element, and five. Um, now, unlike with tuples, we can assign things. Um, we can actually say, no, no, no. The zeroth element of V is not going to be eggs. It's going to be green egg. And number one is going to be, I'm going to add to number one whatever's inside here. That'll be spam. I'm going to add love it. So I'm going to say spam, comma, love it, period. And then I'm going to look at whatever the minus one element is of, of, this, uh, of this list. OK? The minus one element of the list is this one right here, right? That's what we just printed up here. Now, it itself, that minus one element, is of type List, right? Because it's, it's the um, it's the uh, it's the brackets. So now I want the first element of this list. So I'm going to get minus 3.5, and I'm going to set that equal to none, and then I'm going to print out v. Okay. So look at what we did in uh, the in 17. We um, we changed the first element. We appended to the second element. And we, uh, uh, we change something inside of the list that was the last element. So here's the none, and here's the green egg, and here's the spam load. We change stuff inside of that list. OK, so um, let's get everything after that, the second element onward. Oops. Um, Let's make a proto array out of nested lists. So this is an array. So this is going to be a list of lists. And we're going to have a list here, VV, which will be a two element list. And itself will have elements that are themselves lists, which will be two elements. So you can think of this as sort of a two by two matrix, if you'd like to. And let's print the length of that. What's that going to be? Is it four? Two. And you know, if you think of this as an array, you can now create the value of the determinant of that array. Um, and then you just multiply the different elements inside of that array. So think about it this way. The, left, the leftmost call here next to the VV with the brackets is saying, 
slice for me up VV and give me the zeroth element. So that's going to be this one, two. And then give me the zeroth element of whatever comes back. So that's going to be the number one. So I'm going to multiply one times four. That's going to be this part here. And I'm going to subtract off two times three. Okay? So what the main point here is that lists, unlike tuples, are changeable, and you can slice them. Um, they can have heterogeneous elements um, inside of them. How, how does that show that lists are changeable? Um, I changed them. Up in here, I changed them. Oh. I, went into, I went into V, and I was like, nope, your zeroth element is now that. So if you go to a tuple, it's a yeah, so we did that. We did that with the tuple. Um, let's see, where do we do that with the tuple? Here, I said the second element is to, uh, uh, the, the, the third element is false, and it said no, no, no. You're not allowed to. You're not allowed to change that. Okay, so lists um, can be extended and appended. So here, if I have vv equals one, two, three, I can append the number four onto that that does what you think it should. It basically makes the list a little bit longer. And so not only are list elements themselves changeable, the actual length of the list, the number of elements itself, is, um, is changeable. We think of lists as objects, and objects are like animals. You can think of them like you know, bears. They know how to do stuff like eat and sleep. They know how to interact with others, like have babies. They, they have characteristics like height and weight. Um, and knowing how to do stuff is called a method. And in this case, this append method, where it's basically denoted with a dot, um, when invoked is an action that changes the characteristics, the data vector of the list itself. And sometimes we call characteristics attributes. Um, so there's actual data associated with this V, and there's uh, a bunch of methods associated with, um, with this V. Okay, let's go back um, to the notebook. <coughs> okay, so here we're back. Um, we're going to show extending, appending, and popping. Um, so here I'm going to set uh, a vector or, or list v equals one comma two comma three. I'm append the number four onto it. So now v will be one comma two comma three comma four, and I will append minus five to the end of that, but with brackets. So now I got probably something I didn't really want, right? Let's say I had another list, minus 5, minus 6, minus 7. I just want to tack that on to the end of it. It's not exactly what I want here. Um, you see, I wound up getting a five element list back, but now I have uh, four ints and one list as my elements. So we'll see um, a little bit how to deal with that in a second. Uh, so v equals v. Uh, colon four, so I'm going to grab up everything um, to the end here, and then I'll say W is equal to Edelberries plus eggs, and then I'm going to add the two together. And just like tuples, um, we can add lists together, and those lists don't have to be of the same um, element type, right? So I can have a list of strings and a list of numbers, and I can just stick them together. If I want to tack on um, elderberries and eggs onto this other list, what I can do is use a method called extend, which takes v and extends it by w. This is different than append. Append sort of sticks that stuff into new elements. Um, extend is really, in some sense, the, the addition. So I got the same thing as I had here. The plus sign and the extend basically do the same thing. Pop. So this is now thinking of these lists as sort of containers or queues, and pop just sort of removes an element out of that. Let's see what happens when I pop. Eggs. What it does is it takes the last element out, and it just removes it. So what happens when I, press, uh, when I say print V? It's gone. Right, so I didn't say V equals some other representation of V with some method, pop that, right? in memory or in place, the, uh, the values associated with this um, variable v 
have just changed. And so now v is smaller than it was before. If I said the length of whatever comes out of this um, uh, before, I would have had 6, and now I've got 5. I can pop explicitly an item that I want um, by indexing where I want to pop it out from. So now I want to pop out the first one. So if I wanted to create some sort of bu some buffer, like a FIFO buffer or, or, or LILO buffer, you can put stuff into this, um, into this list, save stuff, and then when you want to get something out of it, you can pop it. And you can pop it wherever you want to pop it. So what is that going to be? I popped it. And you notice I didn't print the result of me having popped it. I only, uh, I only printed out the result of, of V afterwards. Um, whenever you have these semicolons, the first thing on the left is executed, then the thing on the right is executed. I could have another semicolon after that. What if, I, what if I executed this again? This is the nice thing about the notebook, by the way. So you can go back in and say, no, that's not really what I want. I'm going to change those codes. Except now I've actually changed V. So V is different than what it was when I ran 28 last time. That's the 28th command I've run. What happens if I try it? Right? Because I just V has just changed, and I try to pop again. I pop again. What's going to happen now? It's an empty list, and I want to pop out the zeroth element of it. You idiot. No, that, that was me, not you. Um, so pop from an empty list. So right, you get back sort of what you think should happen here. OK, so append is a method that adds new elements. Extend uh, concatenates a list, um, and pop removes an element. Uh, lists can be searched, sorted, and counted. This is a question about uh, sorting. So here's my uh, original vector list. If I sort it, there is a concept of sorting that um, can deal with this heterogeneous type. In principle, you could stick a type in here that doesn't know how to be sorted. Um, but Python tries to do the best it can with this built-in sort function. And what it did is, again, it changed v in place. So we notice I had one, three, two, three, four, and it just said, okay, I know numerically how to do this. The letter E, I'm gonna stick at the end. Reverse is a keyword of the method sort. We're gonna see more of this stuff as time goes on. So here I say V dot sort reverse equals true. So you can bet that the default of reverse is actually false. If I print this, what's this gonna say? Elderberries four three blah blah blah. Is that clear? Um, the important thing about sort is that it changes the list in place. <laughs> if I want to look up the index of the number four, I can find out where, given how I just did this sorting, where it should be. What number should that be? Where is four? What element is four? It's the first, right? So that's the zeroth element. That's number one, two, three, et cetera. What's the index of three? How come I didn't get back a list? I have two threes in my, in my list. Well, what index does is it responds back to you with the first element that essentially matches what you've asked for. So if I want to know how many threes there are in my list, I've got two of them. Right, there's my list. So the first three was zero, one, two, and I've got two, I can count them in my list. So now I can know how many elements of different types I've got or different uh, numbers inside. Let's say I want to insert something, and this is essentially the opposite of popping. I can insert uh, the zero at, at the zeroth place, it's full of stars, and I can print out the value of V, and I've just stuck in this value, okay? What if I want to remove the number one? Well, that's sort of like popping, except I'm explicitly saying remove uh, something that's, uh, whose element is equal to the value of one. And I, and I remove that out. Why is that number removed from position? What's that? Why is that not remove whatever's at position one? Um, so that would be pop. Uh -huh. If you want to remove something at position one, you say pop one. 
Okay. Uh, what else are we going to say about this? Ah, so I've been telling you about all this cool stuff about methods, and one of the things that you can uh, use IPython for is to actually help you explore what's available for that object. So go into IPython and say b equals, you know, uh, bracket one, two, three, so you create a list. And then type v dot, and then press the tab button. Whoops. Don't do what I just did. <laughs> ah, where am I? I just kicked it all. Oh, I pressed tab instead. <laughs> I'm getting confused. This is too meta for me. Now I lost my mouse. Okay. Okay, tab. Everyone got that? That was just a keynote bark. That wasn't actually a Python bark. So v dot tab, and this stuff pops out. And you go, whoa, what are all these underscore underscore things? Many of these things, these underscore underscores are kind of methods that you don't traditionally use. They're not thought of as being exposed to the, to the end user. Um, they're sort of private. But um, all of these are methods that we actually want to use. And I think I've introduced you to all of them thus far. So. These are the special methods. We generally don't use them. Um, in advanced use cases, you might. If I now type v dot re, because I know I want to do something that starts with the two letters re, and I press tab again, it'll show me, oh, I can do v dot remove or v dot reverse. OK, what is remove? If you say v dot remove and then question mark and press return, it actually tells you something about what this actually does and what the different keywords are or the actually how you, how you call this method. So in this case, I've got a list and it says remove and I just remove value. Removes the first occurrence of that value. Hey, IPython allows us to essentially get into the documentation at the function or method level and tell us how we should use it. This is not a very descriptive statement about how to use it, but it's pretty clear what it, what it does, right? Um, in many other cases, especially for third-party um, codes that are used very often, is that you'll see very descriptive documentation that gives you even use cases and examples. And that's really nice. Yeah? You can say help. Um, you won't do the tab completion. That's sort of an IPython magic thing. But if you said help v.remove and put, you know, put parentheses around it, so help parentheses that, you would get um, the same thing out of it. Yeah. Go ahead. OK, so uh, Dan's saying v dot underscore, and then try a tab. So the old version of IPython, this is a slightly older version of IPython when I made this, um, uh, apparently just showed you everything. And now you have to explicitly ask for all the sort of magic stuff underneath. Um, okay, let's do uh, let's do dictionaries. Um, I think that's. Yeah. I don't know where we're we gonna do sets. Okay, a little bit more on a um, little bit more on lists. And then we'll go to dictionaries. Um, so here's uh, an iteration over lists. So now we think of these lists not just as containers of elements that may contain data of interest, but now we can say a equals cat window defenestrate. You can look that up if you don't know what that means. And now we'll do a for loop over that list. So this is how we use for loops in Python. 4x in a. So what it's saying is every time you go through another iteration of this loop, set the value of x to be the next element of what's in a. So this is really nice because you don't have to sort of create um, indices, right? I'm not even saying use the seventh element and sort of bump up an index. This is what you would do in C, for instance. I can basically just loop in line uh, from each of the different elements. So the first value of x is going to be cat. And I can get the length of that, and I can print that out, and then window defenestrate. 
Cat 3, Windows 6, Defenestrate 12. If I actually want to have the index, so I want to know um, how, many, uh, how many loops have I been through so far, you can use a built-in function called enumerate, which will return back actually a tuple, but I can immediately assign the values, the element 0 and element 1 of that tuple to be i, which I'll think of as the index, and x, which will be the same thing up here, which is um, the different elements in place. And then what I'll do is I'll print out i, x, and the length of x. So if for some reason you need to actually have an index as you loop through, you can grab that index in a really nice way. But now you notice I don't have to just loop through an index and then go into A and say, give me the ith element of A and call that x. I do that directly in the for loop call. Um, something nice about uh, the way that uh, sort of Python 2 works is that you can add a comma after um, a print statement and it says don't unnaturally add a new line unless I've asked you to do that, but add a little space. So instead of having to scroll all the way down and see three different line outputs, I can see it all on the same line. So the, iteration, the syntax for iteration, which is actually true of any iterable, so anything that can be iterated over, which isn't just lists, it's also tuples, it's also um, sets, it's also other types of variables, and even things like files, once they've been opened, you can think of, of looping over them. If they have a concept of being iterable, um, they will be able to be looped over using this syntax. And you notice this is not right because I haven't put a pass here, I haven't done something inside of here. But for variable name in iterable, so it's uh, in, in turn assigning the variable name to every next element of the, of the list. In, in turn. This should work in IPython. It should work in Python. How do you execute it? Uh, in IPython? Mm -hmm. In IPython, either you can do what I'm doing, where I'm running the selected cell, or you can press Command Return as you're typing this out, and it'll execute that cell. And what it's doing is you're essentially, in, in, in IPython, you'll see more of this when we talk about IPython in the afternoon, um, you'll, you basically build up whatever you want to do of Python-wise inside of a cell, and it doesn't actually execute any of it until you press control return. It sends all of those statements over to the IPython interpreter, which generally will live somewhere else. In this case, it lives for me in a terminal somewhere, but it could live on the other side of the world, serving you your IPython, uh, um, uh, I guess, uh, interactive um, uh, world, and once you send it over, it does what it can, and it sends back the results, and it renders it for you. Yeah? Is this just waiting on, on the Mac to execute the cell in the notebook? It's shift, uh, enter. Shift, uh, enter? Command. Oh, maybe my mess of memory isn't working. Indeed it is. That's why it wasn't working for me before. Um, I don't know why I was thinking command. Thank you. It's shift, and shift return and not command return. That would explain why I was confused. Um, OK, we'll talk about the range function. Um, if I want to say uh, range, I basically, let's see what happens when I say range uh, 4, um, print x. And we'll see what the output of all this is. Oh, yeah, Chris. Um, then I can get rid of all this over here. Although now it's off to the side. Nice. Okay, let's look at what happened here. What did range 4 do? It basically created a list for me that goes from 0 up to 4. And it did it so if I wanted to iterate over it, I could use it. Um, what does that mean? Well, I'm creating a list of essentially five elements up here, and I'm going to loop over, and I'm going to have um, a value associated with each element of this in turn as I loop through. So I'll say the total, which I'll start off at 0, I'm going to add to that total that value. And by adding that value, the total is now that. So by adding 0, the total is 0. By adding 1, the total is 1. By adding 2, the total is 3. By adding 3, the total is now 6. OK? Here's how we call range. 
Um, it's uh, basically a stop. That's the only thing you have to give. And when you look at the documentation for range, you'll see a bracket, which those are generally considered optional. And then um, other brackets, those are also considered optional. So if I only give it one element, um, it's going to be the stopping value. And it's going to start at 0 by default. If I gave it two elements, it would tell me where to start, and it would tell me where to stop. And if I gave it three elements, it would tell me how to step through that. Yes? Um, it creates a, the range creates a real list. So we'll see something in a little bit called X range, which creates an iterator. So if you say X range 10 to the 9, it'll take a little while to populate you know, a place on memory with all of those elements. If you, if you say X range 10 to the 9, and not just range, it will basically do it immediately. And then it'll allow you to iterate over that. So it only uses those elements as need be, just in time. Okay, so total equals zero for val in range. So I'm going to now use um, uh, range in this way. I'm going to start at one, go to ten, and I'm going to step by two. So I'm adding one, three, five, nine. So I started off at one, I counted by two, and I stopped when I got to ten. But you notice the next element would have been eleven if I kept on going. And so that uh, is not allowed because it's at max 10. Yes? Is range only for integers? Um, range is only for integers. There are ways to do things with, uh, if you really wanted to, and the, knowing what you know now, you could basically loop over the results of what comes back from range and create, uh, and create, a, uh, uh, and, and create a float version of that, for instance, or a complex version of that. Range stopped at 9, because what you're saying is the stopping is at 10, and it's the max value that you can associate in the list, and the next one should have been 11. For being a base 0, would it not actually just stop at? No, no, this is the actual value of what it's allowed to stop at. It's not the total number of elements in that. So when I said range 4, um, I actually got back 5 elements from 0 to 4. When I do range 1 to 10, I get 1 to 9. Um, up to and not including. Okay, thanks. But mm, then why did I get? Oh yeah, sorry. Okay, I was thinking I got four back. Yes, thank you. This is not saying give me four elements explicitly. This is saying where to stop. So it's less than equal. Not not less than an equal. It's less than. Thank you. Okay, so let's make a list. Mary had a little lamb. I'm going to loop over the length of this list which will be one, two, three, four, five. And I'll, make a, I'll, I'll basically loop over this. And instead of doing what I said before, we can just say the in, I'm actually going to loop over the index of these elements. And then I'm going to print out the ith version of that. So this might be a little bit more familiar um, if you've been using, uh, if been using um, C. Any questions about this? Yeah. Like a non-uniform indexing in the lists. So if you have a long list and you want to index another list of numbers, like you want to have ten numbers that are non-uniform. Ten numbers that are not uniform with. So you want to slice up the list and we're. You know, the non-uniform set of slices. You generally would do that within a array. You think of that usually with numbers, and you generally would do that with arrays. And then if you're doing things with arrays, you'd use something called numpy which we'll see some of, I think, at the end of today. So you do these sort of crazy slicing and dicing um, uh, in, a, in a somewhat different way, but similar syntax to the colons that we saw before. So you force basically through. So you can do it. You can brute force it. If you've got a million element array and you say, I want the 17th element as long as it you know, has the letter A in it, you can just go through element by element. But there are ways to do it really fast and with basically C helping you under the hood if you do that within um, NumPy. OK, um, let's go on to sets, uh, denoted with uh, curly brackets and not, uh, and not um, the right arrow brackets. So here is, um, here's a set. It's of type set. And you notice something immediately right away. This is different than tuples and lists. What happened here, I got back 
some random ordering or somewhat random ordering of what I put in. When you think of a set, there is no ordering guaranteed in, in how the elements within that set wind up living. And if you need something where ordering is guaranteed, you should be using a list or a tuple. Sets are really just the construction of how we think of sets. It's just, an, it's just a, a bunch of stuff, right? And I, I, there's no guarantee at all how that will wind up being, uh, how that will live on disk. You can still iterate over it, but it's not uh, usually advisable. The type of that is uh, type set. The type of those curly brackets is of type dictionary. So we'll see um, that when you have these uh, curly brackets, we're going to create a dictionary. Um, we'll see that a little bit later on. Um, if you really want to create an empty set, you say set and then um, with parentheses. What, what do you think happens when I say set spam I am? Well, what set, the set constructor does is it says, oh, everything inside of here has got to be an iterable. Well, a string is an iterable, so it's going to look at every character of spam I am and it's going to basically pull out the unique elements of that. So I don't have two A's there, I don't have two M's, but I have all the different elements of spam I am. If I really want to just have a set of spam I am by itself as a single element, I'd have to put brackets around that. Is that clear? Because what's the iterable here that set is being passed? In the case of these brackets, it's being passed a single a list with a single element, and so that is itself going to be defining the set. Yeah. So what I what I pass to Bingo here. Um, so in this case, this is just how you can construct it. You can also go up here and say. So what, it, what I said here is basically go through and loop through the elements and save all the unique elements of this. Bingo itself is an iterable, but it is an element of the list that I passed to set. So it's not going to get iterated over. It's being considered a single block, a single element. Yeah. Uh, well, 55 now has four elements in it. It's a list with four elements. So set loops through that and says, is this unique? Yes, I'm going to take that. Is this unique? Yes, I'm going to take that. And it just does this until it gets to the end of the iterable. That didn't happen here because I gave it a single string without the brackets. And it looped through that and says, oh, I, how do I iterate over this thing? Oh, I'm going to consider this an iterable. Is S unique? Yes. Is P unique? Yes. Is A unique? Yes. M unique? Yes. I unique? Yes. A, no. M, no. You're using iterables as really defining what it is for people who are used to languages with iterators. Um, I mean, I think you're right, but I think the way to think about it is when you think about what is something that can be iterated over, I'm thinking just, just uh, semantically um, in English, something that's iterable, and I haven't given you the deep meaning of it in Python, but it's something that you can essentially step through. And you can think of it as something that can be looped over or something that has elements that I can wind up indexing in turn, right? And there's an order to that. Sets have unique elements. They can be compared, difference, and unionized. So I'm going to create a set. So this is going to create a two-element set with S and P. B is going to be a two-element set of A and M. I'll print A and B. C is uh, some other set, A and M. And you notice that I created B with the set A, M, but I'm going to create set C with A, comma, M, because I've now created a two-element iterable in the form of a list, and I'm going to evaluate whether C and B are the same. And the answer is true. <laughs> is P inside of A, or P in A? Yes, because it's up here. Is PS in A? No. Why not? Because this is, an, this is basically, you're asking, is the element PS in A? What if I, even though I created a set from SP, what if I did this? 
Is that going to work? No. Okay, what is A? It's just P and S, set of P and S. Okay, Q is equal to the set spam I N, that's what we had before. Um, A is subset of Q. Yes. So A is S and is P and S, and the elements of P and S are a subset of whatever is in Q. I can print out Q. Right? There's P and S, it's in there. I can do concepts of ORs on sets. Uh, I can do subtractions on sets. So I can say A or B and subtract off all the elements of that from set Q. And I can do ANDs. So um, like lists, we can think about uh, these as unordered buckets and we can pop stuff off and we get some random element. Um, it's not really advisable to do this, but you're allowed to do it because you're going to get different results on different architectures. So for i in whatever this thing is here, this q uh, union with, or uh, anded with um, a or b, I'm going to print out this result. If you guys do this in your different machines um, and actually execute this directly, you're going to get a different order. At least this order won't be guaranteed. I can remove elements from the set. I can pop stuff off that set. I can keep on popping. Keep on popping until I get nothing left. Just like when we were popping stuff off the list, there's nothing in there, you get an error. Sets are fairly new to the language as a built-in. They've been around for a while. Um, but um, you know, you'll obviously be able to find some place for them in your own code. So um, when we think about dictionaries, they look a little bit like our set construction, except there are these things with colons in here. So favorite cat, none. I don't like cats. Favorite spam, all. Um, and the way that you think about a dictionary is a key and a value, a key and a value. And just like with lists and tuples and sets, each element of a key, of a value, can be whatever it wants. So it itself could be a dictionary or a tuple. Keys have a little bit more restrictions on them, but even keys could be tuples. So um, the way that I index uh, D, or I get at various um, values of those, is I do essentially a, a lookup. And um, I say, OK, for the favorite cat, what is that? None. D, 0. This is not a list. So we don't have a keyword 0, right? This is different. This is, we don't think of these things as sort of ordered lists or tuples. There is no keyword zero. So I get a key error zero. Let me create something else. Um, e is equal to uh, is a dictionary where one key is favorite cat. And you know it's a string and it can have um, spaces in there. Uh, it's none. Favorite spam, all. And the number one which if you ask Google what is, uh, what's the loneliest number, it will respond back one. Um, and I can ask, is, one the lonely, or is E1 the loneliest number? And the answer is true. So now, if I really, really wanted to have something that looks sort of like a list, where I can index it with numbers, I just make my key um, an int. Now this is weird, because I have like kind of mixed key types, right? So I've got two string keys, and I've got one int key. And I've got one variable which is which is of type none, and then I've got you know two other strings. And notice also I have a single uh, single quote here and a double quote here. All that stuff is legal um, within Python. It's not advised to make it sort of this heterogeneous, but you can do it if you need to. Um, e, if I just now essentially print out E, you notice I get it back in an order that's different than the order in which I constructed E, just like with sex. So there is no guarantee that I'm going to wind up getting back the same order. So don't think of sets or dictionaries as some container where you've preserved that kind of order. It turns out there's actually an order dictionary which is starting to come into the language. And in, in probably in a few years, it will be totally built in. But you can get access to that if you really needed it. 
Um, but generally think of, uh, of these dictionaries as unordered. OK. Um, I think I'm going to do a little more dictionary work. Yeah, do a little dictionary work. Um, constructions of dictionaries. Uh, favorite cat, none. Favorite spam, all. Um, that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is say um, what the keys are going to wind up being and what the values are going to be. Key, value, key, value. And then I'm going to print this out. And I cast it with this thing called the dict. But you notice now that my key, which, which once was just basically cat, is now a string called cat. So Python will say, oh, um, what you really wanted to do is make that a string. So I don't, I don't usually use um, this construction here. Another way to do it is just create an empty dictionary with the curly brackets and just start filling it up. Just say, OK, uh, there's a key called cat, and I'm going to have a value associated with that with dog. There's a key, there's a key called one, a value associated with that called uh, the number one, uh, and then so on and so on. If I now print that out, I have a dictionary. And then the last way to do it is you can have a list of tuples. So you have what will become the key, and that's its associated value, key, value, key, value, and then I just say dict my list. What's interesting is I can say, look, so here's how this got printed out, right? So if I ask the same thing here, you notice when I printed out D, I got sort of a different ordering here. I get true. That's not the same thing as if I had a list and the elements were 1, 2, 3, 4, and I compared it to another one whose elements were 3, 4, 2, 1. That would not be considered the same, uh, being the same. But in this case, again, we don't think of ordering, and so what, what's actually being done is at the key value level, there's this inner comparison, and if they're all the same, then it's all OK. Dictionaries can be complicated in a good way. So again, let's start back with D. Um, I can actually now do uh, call D something else. I can have a key of favorites. And now I can say, well, um, I've got a dictionary with a key of cat and a key of spam, least favorite cat, all, et cetera. So I've essentially nested dictionaries here. So I can say my least favorite cat is all of them. And I could say my least favorite spam, none of them. So these are kind of nice containers that you can pass sort of complex data structures around. You can change them on the fly, um, and you can add to them as need be, which is pretty nice. Um, the nice thing uh, I haven't showed you yet is that if you've got a really long line and you want to make your code readable so it's not going you know, way off to the side and cuts, gets cut off in some text editor, you can put a slash here, which just says, I'm not really done making my statement yet. Wait for it um, to complete. So I've created a little, uh, a little phone book here, um, family. Um, here's a, now a list, not a dictionary. My mom, uh, phone number, dad, phone number, friends, Billy, blah, blah, blah. And I can now loop over um, friends and family. So I'm creating basically a list. And I'm going, to, I'm going to loop over, so group type will have, at the beginning, friends. The next time I come back up, it'll be family. I'll print out the group type. And then I'm now going to do another loop inside of that, where I'm going to look at uh, phone numbers. So that's this variable. I'm going to go into the group type. So the first time I'll do that, I'll grab friends. And um, inside of that, so I'm going to create a variable called info. Inside of that, I'll be pointing to the zeroth element and the first element as I loop through. This is only a single element list of friends, Billy. But itself is a tuple, and it has two elements in it, Billy and here. So what I'm printing out here is the name and the phone number. Is everyone OK with that? Any questions? So nested for loops, we're seeing that for the first time. We're seeing basically the, the key lookup. So um, 0 and 1, why am I using that? 
I just said that we're using dictionaries, but in this case we're not because we're actually just looking at tuples, zero and one. So that, that is actually well defined. Yes? No, so info is um, a variable that's getting created and getting assigned a value each time I loop through here. And in this case, within a given group, I'm going to loop through all the phone numbers I have. So in the case of families, I only had one phone number, or friends. In the case of family, I've got two phone numbers, so it's going to loop twice. And the first time um, that I loop through here, when I have group type equal to friends, info is going to be assigned the value Billy, comma, whatever that phone number is. Yes? Do you have an example with like a long list of numbers? Because here you have equals zero and equals one. So in a given case, in real case, you have like n different thousands. So yeah, you'll get to play a little bit with, with the sort of mixed types and stuff in the breakout session. Yes? Yes? Yeah, so the question is converting back and forth. I'll show you a slide on that. Um, OK, if I want to know what all the keys are within phone numbers, I can create a list. And that just gets me family and friends. Thing to note here is that we don't know which order this is going to come back in because the dictionary itself is unordered. So I don't know whether friends or family are going to come first. I can get all the values associated with the keys. And again, this dot thing means that keys and values are actually methods that are called on types of dictionaries. So instead of having to explicitly say friends and family to create a list to loop over, I can just say, OK, I don't know what's in there, but let me just loop over all the keys, and let me just see what I get back out of that. So I should get back the same thing. In this case, I didn't know whether friends or family would come up first. And on different machines, you'll get back a different ordering. So if you really cared to have friends first and then family, you would um, have to deal with that and actually explicitly uh, say, I want friends first. So we don't know the order. But one way we can ensure that it's always the same on all machines is to get that list of keys, sort that list, and that sorting will be preserved across different, uh, different architectures, and then I can print that out. So this is a less volatile way. And you notice family came before friends, which it should, um, and because of this A coming before the R. Um, OK, so uh, there's another method, which is called iter items. It's a little bit like enumerate for lists, but this is for dictionaries. So group type and val. So now I'm going to populate two variables as I go through this list. This is the key. This is the value associated with that key. And I'm going to loop over using this thing called iter items. So what it's going to do is it's going to go into this dictionary. And it's going to say, OK, assign group type equal to family. Um, and assign, uh, assign info equal to all this stuff here. So here we go. So now I get to loop over very much more succinctly. We're getting back something pretty sensible. So there's lots of different ways to do the same thing, but I'm showing you this just to give you some sense of what, when uh, ordering matters, how we do sort of iteration over these complex types. Yes? Can you sort the iter items on the block? Um, you could, so it is actually returning back an object which is iterable. I don't think it's sending back a list that then gets iterated over. So I believe. Unless iter items has a sort key, keyword associated with it, it will just return back whatever order it, it wants to give it to you. So the way to really do it, where you're being very careful about preserving order, would be this. And I'm not sure if, Paul, do you know if iter items has been deprecated in three? I heard some. No, no, I'm not here. Sorry. Yeah, I think iter items is falling out of fashion for some reason. Um, all right, let's get some uh, value. Let's get some values. Oh, so. Phone number of my coworkers. I don't have coworkers, so I get a key error. Um, I can ask something more graceful. Let's say I don't want my program to, to barf on me. I can say, does it have a key or has underscore key? 
false. So it's get, giving me back a Boolean. I can do a get, which will basically give me back the value of the coworker's value if it's there. If not, it will return back a none. So that's pretty graceful. Um, phone numbers dot get friends equals phone number friends. So these are really two different ways of looking up the values associated with the friends, friends keyword. And those are the same. And if I want to go look at get, and I actually want to have um, a default value in case there are no values associated with that, you can do um, the key that you're looking for and then the default that comes back there. Instead of getting back a none, you get back whatever else you want. Uh, we can set values, so phone number friends dot append. So um, let's see what that looks like. So I actually just said, oh, well, friend, the value of friends associated with this keyword friend uh, or the key friends is a list. And I know how to append to lists. I can add Marsha on top of that, right? So now Marsha is part of my friends. What if I did this again, by the way? What if I ran this again? I get two Marshas. If this was a set instead of a list, and I try to add Marsha again, I wouldn't get it. Right? Um, Billy's phone number changed. Um, he moved away. And so I can access Billy um, by going into friends. I know that Billy is the zeroth element of friends here, so that's this zero. And I can go to the first element of that tuple, and I can assign it what I want. Oh, but you can't do that. Why can't I do what I just what I said I could do? Because tuple does not support item assignment. We can't change a tuple once it's been created. I can create elements of I can change elements of a list. So I can just say, okay, the new thing is Billy this, right? And that should be legal. It is. I lost all my friends preparing for this Python class, which is true. Um, phone number, uh, friends. I'm basically going to set that to an empty list. I'm going to pop off all my friends. I don't have any. Let's print the phone numbers. I don't. So I actually had an empty list here. Let me try this. So you see I have an empty list. And I say, well, if it's empty, why do I even need this key here, right? So I'll just pop off that key. So again, we have, dictionaries have this concept of pop. And I can print the phone numbers. And if I really want to, instead of popping, one way to do it is actually delete that key. And you do this thing called del. And if I print the phone numbers, I've got an empty dictionary. Um, update uh, is very handy, like append um, for lists, phone number dot update. Uh, friends, so I can add stuff back in. And that's really how you wind up changing in, in, uh, uh, a dictionary sort of in place. Okay, so casting back and forth. We can go between tuples and lists. Um, so we, here we've got this crazy A here of um, uh, basically a list with four elements in it. I can make a tuple out of it, and you notice that all I really did was just change from the square bracket to the, um, to the parentheses. I can make a list out of the result of that, and I get back what I had before. Um, I can create a set out of that. I can create lists out of sets, sets out of lists. Usually when it makes sense and you need to do it, it'll be clear how to do it. Um, but what, one of the sort of important things in this casting is that you're not sort of cascading through the whole thing. When I say make this thing into a set, all you're doing is going through, let's say, a list, and you're basically taking that whole list and you're turning the whole thing into, um, into a set, <coughs> element by element. You're not actually digging into each of those elements and casting those also as sets. Okay. So if you've got a long list and you want to basically make a shorter list that only has unique elements of that list, cast that list to a set and then cast that set to a list, and all of a sudden you've got only the unique elements of that list. Um, when we did these loops, in some ways this gets into this slicing and dicing question, uh, we wanted to say, let's say we have this crazy sort of, uh, I want to have a list of all numbers from 0 to 10, 
whose lowest two bits are both 1, but not divisible by 11. Again, because crazy, and I want to know that. Um, so here we go. That's the answer. And I did this by looping over all the numbers less than 101, not less than or equal to 101. And I asked this question if, um, if I do a bitwise and with 2, a bitwise and with 1, and this number is not um, equal to 0. Um, that is the mod operator. I don't have any remainder. <clears throat> Make it, put it into my list, and I appended it onto my list, and I got back my result. List comprehension is a, a sort of nicer, cleaner way to do that, where basically you create a list on the fly, and you basically stick your for loop inside of that list. This works for dictionaries, by the way, in sets, but um, usually these are only done on lists. So here, here's what's going to happen. The elements of this list will be the value of num. For every number in the range uh, 0 to 100, if this whole thing evaluates the true. And what happens is Python looks at that and says, oh, you wanted me to iterate over this thing here, populate it with num, evaluate this truth statement, and, and populate this list with those values if that truth statement, uh, evalu if that evaluates to be true. Yeah? Specifically, this, how, how do you know for sure what the order of uh, evaluation is? Say if you get a long set of things. You, so you usually do this as sort of one-offs. You wouldn't try to coerce your like 17 line for loop into one of these. Um, and you can do this in a nested way where you have the equivalent of multiple for loops. I think once you get beyond one for loop and you're just asking essentially a few line question on the data where you're just sort of looping through something like in an existing list or you're creating a new list, that's where I, that's where I would do it. But once it gets bigger than that, forget it. And once you know that this is how it works, you basically, in the middle of it, you have your iterable, you iterate over that, you basically have a truth statement or not. If I didn't have any of this, I would just get back that. So if I get rid of all of this, there's nothing to evaluate to be true or false. And so I would just get back every number from 0 to 100. But I could also just do that with range. OK, so I get back the same thing. Um, here's a little bit more of a complicated example with particles. Uh, I've got a list. So the outer part here is a list. Okay, so I've got a list of things. Those things happen to be a list of dictionaries. And those dictionaries themselves have um, two keyword uh, value pairs, right? So keyword value, key value. So name is pi plus, mass is some number, blah, 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 right? If I want to get all the mesons um, that have a mass less than 1,000, uh, and a mass greater than 100. What I do is I loop over all the particles. So I'm now assigning a value to x. And what is x when I loop through this? It's going to be a dictionary. And what I'll do is I'll save a tuple of name and mass that basically matches this, uh, this filter. And if I want to get the average of all the, ma of all the mesons in that uh, mass range, um, total equals uh, 0. And then I can say 4x equal my mesons, um, total plus equals uh, this second element here, the mass. You notice here, if I only have one thing to evaluate inside the for loop, you don't have to put it on an indented line. The average in, of mesons in this mass range is I'm going to cast through a string, the total divided by the total number of mesons that pass this. And if I want to print out the name of the Maison that passes that, oh, that's ugly. That is some uh, representation. You see here, I've got this like nice little pie here. I've got other um, uh, Greek uh, alphabet elements. Um, this is how Python is representing the string internally. Um, and it's just showing me how it represents it. If I actually print that out, I get a sort of nice um, representation of that as best it can within the interpreter. This is getting into a little bit of the sort of beyond the standard ASCII stuff that we're, not, we're going to try to avoid. But sometimes it is unavoidable. OK, so we're ready for the breakout session. Um, any questions before I introduce it? Good. OK, 
Here is the following data. This lives, by the way, in airline.py, which is uh, linked from the, the website. So go grab it. You've got a bunch of airports, and this is a dictionary. So it's got basically the three-letter code that resolves. This is the key. That's the value. Resolves to the full name. Um, you've got a bunch of different flights. Uh, Southwest, that's the name of the airline. That's the flight number. Um, that's the airport that it's, uh, that it's um, uh, leaving to. Um, this is the uh, gate number, and that's the total time, or that's actually when it's going to fly out. So it's using these two pieces of data. So you've got a dictionary, and you've got a list. And you notice that list has uh, tuples in them. Print out a schedule that's organized by airline. So it should look something like this. Don't worry so much about the, um, the actual total numbers of spaces. You can try to get that working right. But just try to make sure that you're organized by airline. So all the Southwest Airlines, make sure you print them all, all out together. Um, although I don't really care which order they're in. Um, print out a schedule organized by time. And to do this, you're going to have to do sorting on the last element of each flight before uh, beginning the printing. OK, go for it. 